Good evening, Charlotte Avenue family. I hope that you are having a good day, have had a good day. And I'm glad that you're taking the time to uh, join us as we think about uh, Bible devotional. This, uh, this Sunday morning, we talked about uh, some rhythms, some things that we want to get into, the opportunity we have during this, this time of uncertainty and change to get into some new rhythms. And as we want to be in step with Jesus, we consider the idea of wanting to be in rhythm with Jesus. And the two that we talked about were Bible study, regular engagement in Bible study, and then meditation upon God's Word, thinking about it, considering how does God's Word apply to my life? What are the things that I should do. So what, one thing that I wanted us to think about and one thing that we wanted to do is to consider, uh, or for perhaps even just for me to, to give you an example of one way of how, how do you study the Bible? How do you go about studying the Bible? What's the difference between reading the Bible or reading a passage in Scripture and actually sitting down and studying and, and thinking about it? And, and that's something that we want to make sure, the, the elders here I'm sure would want us to, to make sure that all of you, all of us as Christians are equipped to be able to do these types of things. We know, for again, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So we want to. We know the Word of God is is good for those things, but we want to make sure what's our approach uh, to studying the Bible. There are a lot in, in out there in the world, and in the the idea of, of even academics, and even certainly within Christianity, a number of different ways that we can can study God's Word, and I want to share just one way with you this evening. It's called inductive Bible study. Inductive Bible study, and basically the, the idea is that we use the information about a specific situation, perhaps a specific uh, passage, and we draw a conclusion. Uh, sometimes those may be specific conclusions. Okay, well, they did this, and I need to do the same thing. And sometimes they may be more general conclusions. Uh, and there are basically three steps. You might say four steps, uh, but, but three or four steps for the Bible study, uh, inductive Bible study method. The first one, or maybe even the, the precursor to any Bible study, is that you need to consider the context. You need to know what's going on. What book of the Bible am I reading? Uh, what book of the Bible does this scripture come from? Is it a, a part of the book? Uh, is it a part of the, a, a book of the Bible? Is it actually scripture, or is it just something that someone has written that is a, a, a spiritual thought? There's a big difference between a, a, a spiritual thought that someone writes and, and actually a book of the Bible that is scripture. Again, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture comes from God. If it's outside of scripture, it might be right or it might be wrong. It might be a good thought. It may sound like a good thought and it may not be a good thought. But all scripture, the Bible, is inspired by God. It's a message directly from God. So we need to consider, is it from, is it from scripture itself? Uh, who's the author? Uh, what's the situation? What's the context? What's the, the time and the place? What's the setting there? Uh, and then what's the timeline uh, of, of biblical history? Is it Old Testament? Is it New Testament? Is it time in the, uh, the, the patriarch fathers of the very beginning of the, uh, the Old Testament? Or is it now in the, the church age in the New Testament after Acts chapter 2? What's going on and what's the, what's the context historically? What does this mean in, in God's relationship with mankind and, and vice versa? And how does these... How do these things affect what the, the passage may say? One thing that is always good to do is if you're reading a specific passage, you certainly definitely want to read at least the few verses ahead and the few verses before. If you're listening to maybe a chapter in the Bible and you're really not just listening to it, and here's maybe the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible, not just listening to it, but studying it. Uh, if you're studying it's one chapter, it may be good to at least listen to the chapter before and listen to the chapter after before you study the chapter that you're on to. Remember listening and listening, but studying. But that, help, that will help you to understand the context. So that, that is whether you're using the inductive Bible study method or any other Bible study method, uh, it is always important. This is kind of a, a precursor to any step of any variety of any type of Bible study. You need to understand the context because context will always matter. That's true in just about everything in life, but certainly true of Bible study. So if we look at that as a, a precursor, uh, then here is step number one of the three steps of the inductive Bible study method. Number one is observation. And, and this one it can be fairly straightforward. The, the question is, what does the passage, what do the verses, what does the chapter, what does the book, what is what I am studying, what I'm trying to understand better, what does it say? 
Uh, again, fairly straightforward, but we must make sure that we understand unfamiliar words or phrases. As an example of that, not from Scripture, but a scriptural idea, and again, consider that, uh, the song, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing, I believe it's the second verse, one of the verses, uh, starts out with this, this phrase, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Now we know the importance of, of singing to God and making melody in our hearts, but we also know the importance of, of understanding the message that we're offering up to God in our songs and our hymns and spiritual songs. We need to understand what we're singing. So what's an Ebenezer? When we sing, Here I Raise My Ebenezer, what is that talking about? Well, we know from Scripture that there are a number of instances of someone raising up an Ebenezer. And sometimes that word has been used, and in different versions that word may still be used today. But an Ebenezer was a stone of remembrance. A stone of remembrance. Perhaps uh, one of the easiest one when Jacob uh, is fleeing from Esau and he sleeps that night uh, and he has a vision from God and God promises to be with him in the book of Genesis. Uh, the next morning, he, as he had laid his head upon that stone, the next morning he wakes up and he raises it up and he, he makes a, a, a dedication to God, he, a, a stone of remembrance. I'm going to remember, God, what you have promised to me and if you do these things, then I will follow you. And he, he raised up an Ebenezer. In the same way, that song is encouraging us to remember the things that God has done for us. But if we don't know that, then we're singing a song perhaps without understanding, which is perhaps even vain worship to God. So there's an example of understanding certain words or phrases that we may be unfamiliar with. And certainly there are words in the Bible uh, that we don't use in our everyday conversation. So we need to, as we study the Bible, if we're reading a passage and we don't know what it's talking about, if we don't know a word or a phrase, then we may have to, you know, look it up. Um, we have to do some time in, in, in uh, understanding what it is saying. Because if we don't understand what it's saying to start with, then none of these other things are going to matter. So once we understand what does the passage say, number two, uh, on the, the passages or the, the ideas that I found of the inductive Bible study method, they, they called number two the number two step interpretation. I'm not exactly comfortable with that because in 2 Peter chapter uh, 1 verses 19 and 20 or verses 20 and 21 it says this. But know this first of all that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So this gives us, a, again, a little bit of an idea of how uh, the Bible was, was given to us. That men moved by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote down these words or proclaimed these prophecies or these scriptures, this, this message from God. So when, when we think about the inductive Bible study method, step number one, observing, what does it say? Step number two, again, called interpretation. But what we're trying to do is not to, to read our own interpretation into Scripture. We, we don't want to do that. No prophecy of Scripture, no message of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. But men moved by God gave the prophecy or gave the Scripture as we have it today. So what we want to understand is what did God mean when he gave us this information? What was the meaning? Meaning that God gave. Listen, that we could we could all come up with a different interpretation of any number of scriptures, but I promise you that God meant something when He gave it to us. And what we want to understand is, okay, what did God mean? What is what is the original message? What is the original meaning to the original audience? Uh, these books were written to people in the first century and those Christians and their circumstances. What was the meaning? What was God trying to communicate to them in the very beginning? What were they supposed to do with the message? What were they supposed to do uh, with, this, uh, with this word that was given to them? So that's what we, what we want, under, want, want to understand. And then thirdly uh, is application. And this application, yes, in step number two, we, we in some ways recognize the application for the original audience. Now number three, we say, okay, well, that's what it meant for them. What is that message? What does that mean? What does that application in their setting, how does that translate to me today? And again, in many ways, sometimes it will be very straightforward. We're going to use an example of that here in just a minute. Sometimes it will be very straightforward. The very same thing that it meant for them in their context, it will mean for us in our context. An example of when that isn't the case, though, is so anytime, just about anytime, we study the Old Testament. Uh, maybe not every time, but specific Old Testament laws, such as animal sacrifices, uh, such as uh, certain ritual days. Okay, well, what did that mean for them? Well, in some ways, it was very straightforward. On this day, you do this, or if you commit this sin, or in this situation, you offer this sacrifice. Okay, well, do we offer sacrifices in the New Testament anymore? We don't. 
So, so we, we can't make, make a, a direct correlation or a direct application from many Old Testament scriptures, specifically those talking about uh, animal sacrifices or certain rituals that the Old Testament were a part of. However, are there many principles in the Old Testament uh, that we need to make sure that we follow? Absolutely. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, you know, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are we still supposed to do that today? Absolutely, we're still supposed to do that today. So, so there can be application made, but sometimes that specific application, especially from Old Testament passage, isn't true today under the New Testament. Uh, and maybe even sometimes from, from century to century or timeline to timeline, some things won't be exactly the same. Another example of that, um, when Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if whoever forces you to go with him one mile, go with him two. Again, that was specific. The Roman soldiers by Roman law could come up to any citizen of the empire and say, carry my belongings for one mile. And Jesus says, okay, well, when someone forces you to do that, you go the second mile with them. You literally at least go a second mile with them. There's an application there. But that application may not be a literal application today. Uh, we go the extra mile, but not uh, perhaps not literally an extra mile. So the third one, the third one for us today is application. What does it mean to me? How do I apply it in my life? Maybe even in specific aspects of my life. All right, and, and turning your Bibles to Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter eight. We're going to look at verses thirty-four through thirty-six uh, for a brief inductive Bible study tonight. Acts eight thirty-four through thirty-six. Uh, first of all, let's set the context. We're in the book of Acts, which is a history book. It's the history, it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's a history of, of the, the Apostles' early Acts and also the early church. Uh, in Acts uh, chapter 8 earlier, or chapter 7, uh, Stephen has been uh, put to death. So kind of the first martyr of, of the church uh, we recognize in Acts chapter 7. Uh, and from that, in the beginning of Acts chapter 8, because of the persecution that arose at that time, uh, the church, Christians, have left Jerusalem and they're going you know, basically into all the the world and they're taking the message of the gospel with them. Uh, Philip, the apostle, uh, we find in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 4, he's in Samaria. Remember, that's where the Samaritans live, and we can think about all the context of the Jews and the Samaritans and their relationship. Uh, but he is there in Samaria, uh, and he's, he's uh, along there preaching with some of the other apostles and disciples, and he's told by an angel uh, to go to a specific place uh, in verse 25. Uh, and he finds there an official of the court of the, of the, the queen of Ethiopia. Uh, and upon finding him, he's told again by the Spirit to go up to him, go up to the chariot and join him. And he goes up to the Ethiopian in his chariot. He Seemingly they're riding along in this chariot, and the Ethiopian is studying from the book of Isaiah. Okay, and what does it say? Let's read what it says in verses 34 through 36 uh, as we've set this, the setting in the context. The eunuch answered Philip and said... Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, began, he preached Jesus to him. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? Well, so what does what does it say? This may be a, a situation again, not always perfect thing to do this, but but recount the story or recount the passage in your own words. What does it say? Okay, the Ethiopian is there. Eunuch has joined him. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. He needs some help understanding what Isaiah is saying here. Uh, and we see here that Philip starts with that passage. And from that Old Testament passage in the book of Isaiah, uh, we learn that he begins to preach Jesus to him. And then at the end of the passage, in the last verse, as they're traveling along, they come across some water. And the Ethiopian uh, asks, hey... There's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And then we see in verse 38 that we didn't take the time to read, but again, read before and read after uh, to, to set the stage. We, we know that he will actually become, he will be baptized uh, as a part of this process of becoming a Christian, okay? So we, we have seen what does it say, okay? Secondly, uh, what does it mean? What's going on here? What's, what, what is, uh, what's the situation? What's the, the message that those first reading the book of Acts what were they supposed to get? Well, remember, remember, again, and this may be one of the easier uh, aspects of this, this is a history book. So it's a historical account. It is, uh, it is an account of here is a situation that Philip encountered through God by the Holy Spirit to uh, approach this eunuch, and here's what happened in this, this specific situation. So it's a, a, a historical account specifically, but what is it a historical account of? Someone becoming what? A Christian. That's important. 
Okay, it's a historical account of in the first century how did this specific Ethiopian eunuch as he was reading from the Old Testament and Philip, an apostle of Jesus Christ, was able to come to him and preach to him Jesus so that he would become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, what happened in this situation. Uh, number three, we have uh, a personal application. Okay, so we, we learn in step number two, uh, it's a historical account of how someone became a Christian. And, and here are, are four lessons we can take in, in number four, number, excuse me, step number three of a personal application. Uh, what can we take from this? First of all, we can see that Jesus can be taught from the Old Testament. That, you know, they didn't have the, the New Testament at the time. And Philip starts with the Old Testament and specifically this, this prophecy of Jesus coming in the book of Isaiah. And he begins there. He begins where the person is and takes them to where they need to be in knowing more about Jesus. And secondly, we can recognize that there must be in the preaching of Jesus, because that's what Philip was doing from this passage. He preached Jesus to him. And what conclusion does the Ethiopian come to? There's water, what prevents me from being baptized? Okay, so in the preaching of Jesus, baptism must be included within the preaching of Jesus because that's what Philip was doing. And the Ethiopian says, there's water, what prevents me from being baptized? So somewhere in that conversation that we're not privy to, baptism must have been included in the midst of that conversation. Uh, thirdly, baptism is a part of being a follower of Jesus. Again, why was Philip teaching the Ethiopian about Jesus? so that he would become a follower of Jesus. It seemingly, you could say that Philip could have said, well, Isaiah is talking about this and only stayed Old Testament, only stayed relation to, to Isaiah specifically, but he preached to him Jesus because that's what Isaiah was prophesying about and that's the culmination of the Old Testament. Jesus is where all of us need to be heading. Number four, uh, paired with, again, in a, in a greater context uh, of the book of Acts, Paired with the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Paired with those Samaritans in Acts chapter 8 verses 5 through 12 uh, and verse 13. Paired with Saul's conversion as he uh, would become a Christian and later become Paul in Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and following. Paired with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 when uh, the Gentiles become Christians. Paired with Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Paired with the Philippian jailer also in Acts 16. Paired with the Corinthians in Acts chapter 18. Paired with the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19. We have his historical accounts in the Bible of how people became Christians. And one thing that we know from this passage in Acts chapter 8 and from all of those other passages that I just mentioned, baptism is always included. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and following, it talks about us being baptized into Christ. From the very beginning of Christianity, we can see in the book of Acts that baptism has always been a part of the plan. We're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins so that we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. So as we think about inductive Bible study, you consider, first of all, what's the context? What's going on? What's the situation? Then, then step number one is what does it say? What does the passage say? And we need to make sure that we understand phrases or words that we may not understand. Secondly, what was the original meaning? What was the original way that God meant for the, the message to be received? And then thirdly, what is that application for us today? So for us today, we recognize from Acts chapter 8, verses 34 through 36, that baptism is a part of being a follower of Jesus. So our question for us today is, have I been baptized? If I want to be a follower of Jesus, have I been baptized into Jesus? And then that's where we have to come to the conclusion, do I want to be baptized or do I not? Brothers and sisters, I know that was a little bit longer one than normal, uh, but I hope that it was a good one. And I hope that as we have, have it, are accepting this rhythm challenge or this challenge of placing more rhythms into our lives, that we will place the rhythm of regular Bible study and uh, meditation upon God's Word into our life. And I hope that's one tool that you can use to make that happen. Have a great day.